Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome our online audiences and our live stream audiences, and also those who will come later um, on watching our videos either on YouTube or Facebook. This is one of over 600 programs we've done since the pandemic began. And it's a fascinating story um, that Rebecca has unearthed about her great great aunt, um, Mildred Harnock, who was a grad student in Berlin uh, in the early 30s, uh, 1930s that was, and uh, in Berlin, and uh, ended up in the resistance against Hitler. A fascinating story. Rebecca, thank you very much for joining us at the Commonwealth Club to share your story. Thank you, George. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I think we'll, before we get to Mildred, um, let's come right up to the current time. Um, you investigated this story about your relative. You found out not only, I mean, she, she's known, people have known about her. Her whole story hasn't been that well, but she's, she wasn't erased from the history. Um, but your family wasn't over, <clears throat> overwhelmingly interested in having her story uh, you know, be part of the family lore. So you had to, had to pass, pass through those barriers. Did you, does anybody in the family think that you went too far by, by bringing all the information out or not? No, no. And, and the members of my family who felt this way was uh, really was limited to uh, just one, who was my, my great grandmother, Harriet, mm. who was Mildred's eldest sister. Uh, oh. And she did urge the family to burn all of Mildred's letters and photographs after Mildred was executed. And there was a personal reason for that. Uh, her own daughter, um, got involved. So we want you to say a little bit about Jane too. So sure, can, yes, Jane, yeah. my grand, my grandmother, uh, Jane was 21 when she decided to uh, go to Berlin and to live with Mildred, whom she idolized. And, uh, and so while she was there, she fell in love with a German man who actually was uh, secretly involved in the resistance as well, although she did not know it. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they got married. And, and, so, and then she got caught up in Germany during the Second World War. So her mother, Harriet, was uh, tremendously, um, well, she, let's just say she wasn't happy about the situation. Right. So that was one of, one of the reasons that she was deeply resentful of, of Mildred for enticing her daughter to Berlin. Um, and, you know, another reason I think that, that my great-grandmother was upset, that this was the way that she dealt with her grief. It was tremendously mm. uh, traumatic to learn that her uh, youngest sister was beheaded on Hitler's direct order. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was also the, the taint of, of communism. Um, yeah. Mildred was, was associated uh, thought, with, uh, with um, other people who were uh, in, in the, on the left end of the political spe spectrum. And she was uh, uh, definitely sympathetic to certain ideals of communism. And, uh, and so uh, she was viewed after the war through a Cold War lens. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ironically, because, or at least painfully ironically, because the Soviet Union obviously was our partner during the, uh, the war, but That's right. yes. it, it still wasn't acceptable. Um, your parent, who is the child of, of uh, Jane, father or mother? Oh, father, uh, yes, my father. father. Mm -hmm. and, and was he alive at the time? Because I know Jane had to escape with children, right? So was he, he alive? He had to escape with children, and he was alive, yes. He was yeah. alive. Does he remember this at all? Uh, oh yes, he does. He has um, several vivid memories of of uh, of that time, um, and uh, but he never met Mildred. Uh, by this point, um, yeah. they, they had been separated, and and she was beheaded uh, in 1943. Right. All right. So that's the background, family background, and everything. First of all, uh, fascinating insight into two things: one, one particular woman's journey in in, in this time, but also what it was like. Um, to be right in the middle of 
the Nazis beginning and growth and, and, and their influence and how they changed things. And there have been things, of course, written on it, but this was a great personal story that gives you an insight on, on how, what it's like to be in a situation where uh, an organization of the government is ratcheting it up every, yes. every six months. Um, and I thought you captured that uh, really wonderfully. So um, why don't we talk, yeah, why don't we talk a little bit about how Mildred found herself in Berlin? Yes, uh, well, so Mildred was uh, born and raised in Milwaukee. She uh, had a rather impoverished childhood. Um, her father was a frequently unemployed insurance salesman slash um, uh, a store clerk slash butcher slash horse trader. <laughs> uh, so you get the idea. Um, her mm -hmm. mother was a suffragette. A, a self-taught stenographer and supported the family when the father uh, went off uh, for weeks at a time and disappeared. Um, and so Mildred uh, grew up uh, from, you know, moving from one boarding house to another every time their father could not pay the rent. So Neither what year, she was, sorry, but she was yeah. born, it almost sounds like a, a 30s story, but she was born in like 1905 or 1902. 1902. 1902. Yes. So, so her father doing all this was in the 19... Thoughts, so to speak, and then yes. yeah, okay. And 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 then in, and then he did die alone mm -hmm. in a barn, um, and and so Mildred uh, then her mother moved her to Chevy Chase, Maryland, where she uh, basically lived um, for the next year while she attended school in Washington D.C. in Georgetown, and um, mm -hmm. and it was a very different kind of experience for her. Uh, the, the children of senator, senators and diplomats went there, and and she declared her desire to go to college. Uh, neither of her parents had attended college, so mm -hmm. in 1919. Um, uh, she, uh, she made this declaration and so she, she attended, um, she went to the University of Berlin, uh, pardon me, that was later, she went to the University of, of uh, Wisconsin and um, she received her BA in Humanities and while she was there she was radicalized, she joined a student group um, called the Friday Nighters, which was a sort of fizzy mix of self-proclaimed socialists and anti-fascists and communists and uh, it was there that she met Arvid Harnock, who was a German, uh, who was also um, at this point that she was uh, pursuing her master's degree, I should mention. Um, so after her BA, she enrolled in a master's program. And she met Arvid Harnock. Uh, he shared her um, concern and, and passion for women's rights um, and for workers' rights. They were both very much uh, influenced by the progressive movement in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a week after she received her master's degree, they married. And then in 1929, after teaching for a year at Goucher College in Baltimore, she joined Arvid in Germany and enrolled in a PhD program. And so it was her intention to get her PhD. He was also working on his PhD. And, and they envisioned a, a, a quiet academic life uh, where mm -hmm. they would teach at a German universities and maybe in, at also in American universities and sort of go across the Atlantic, um, have some children and live out their lives that way. But, um, mm -hmm. but, but really their political beliefs um, uh, uh, drove them in a different direction. And so I, at, the, that, yeah. at the time there was, there was a relatively large group of Germans uh, at the end of the 20s, early 30s, who were in favor of a, of a form of socialism or communism or, or you know, all, all across that spectrum. Yes. And, and it, was a, it was a bigger group than the Nazis. Um, oh, yes, much bigger. Much bigger, well, yeah. Well, it should be remembered, so a year yeah. before Mildred moved uh, to Germany, um, in 1928, uh, the Nazi party got less than 3% of the vote mm -hmm. in their Reichstag election, the, the German par parliament. Mm -hmm. um, less than 3%. And then two years later, it got 18%. And then mm -hmm. two years later in 1932, it got 37%. And by that mm -hmm. point, it was for the first time the largest party in the Reichstag. Mm -hmm. And Mildred bore witness to this as an American. And she mm -hmm. was appalled by the meteoric rise of the Nazi party. And uh, it was during this time that she decided to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, at 37%, that was the highest vote that they got. It was then that, that Hitler made a deal and, and got the chancellorship and then moved on from there to just take over, so. He was, uh, well, that, that was on July 31st, 1932. Yeah, and, right. and so Mildred, during this time, I should sort of back up in, in, in terms of the chronology of her involvement in the resistance. 
1932, she was lecturing at the University of Berlin, lecturing about American literature. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she was uh, quite forthright in her um, views or her political views. She, she lectured about uh, William Faulkner and John Dos Passos and Theodore Dreiser, um, but, but her lectures moved fluidly from American novels to the present prevalence of the poor in Nazi Germany and the troubling ascent of the Nazi party. Um, and I shouldn't say Nazi Germany yet, it wasn't yet Nazi Germany. At the time it was a, a parliamentary democracy, but mm -hmm. it seemed to be moving in the direction uh, toward fascism. And so she began to recruit her students. Um, and uh, just as she was very mindful of uh, sort of ensuring that, that they were like-minded and, um, and she would invite them to her apartment in Berlin. Arvid did this too, and he invited friends and colleagues and friends of friends. And they began to discuss what to do about this uh, troubling trend. And then uh, uh, in 1933, um, in January, when Hitler did uh, uh, was appointed chance chancellor, um, then uh, her, her involvement in the resistance, both um, or her commitment to it, deepened. And at the same time, she had to be, she and Arvid both had to be much more cautious about mm -hmm. how they would proceed. And Mildred became much more cautious about how she would um, recruit Germans into the resistance. Um, the University of Berlin did fire her uh, ostensibly mm -hmm. for, uh, there was some dissatisfaction with uh, how um, outspoken she was. And then in the fall of 1932, um, she got a job at, an, at a night school for, um, for Germans who were unemployed uh, or, or uh, basically working class Germans. And it was there uh, where she found some of her most committed uh, members of, uh, of the group. She recruited them into, into this group that she nicknamed the circle. So at this time it was just, uh, um, there, there, there was, uh, it would come to be called something else, uh, which I can get to with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I can describe how that happened. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, at this time, it was a very sort of informal, scrappy group um, of political activists. Well, it's, it's uh, you know, the fascinating parallels uh, that I thought uh, that you should demonstrate as that process was under, being undergone with, uh, that there were quite a few professional women uh, in society in Germany. Um, in addition to the, the constraints against Jews that were put into place early about your job and being in the professions. There was also a, a dismissal of women from their jobs simply to yeah. get the women back out. I mean, partially it's the depression and people, you know, like we did after World War II, that the women can go back home again and, and uh, the men will take the jobs. It was one of those kind of things, but uh, it can be part of the popularity of the Nazi party in doing this, right? And in, 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 in for the men, they oh, yeah. get them their jobs and, and get rid of the women. And so she was part of that. It's also, I think, important to point out that, that these writers that she focused on were writer, American writers that were focused on the poor and how the poor were being you know, uh, uh, abused in society and that this was part of, of her socialistic idea along the uh, Absolutely. Right the start. Yeah. Yes, yes. And she wrote about this extensively in her letters to her mother uh, mm -hmm. back in, in the United States. And she wrote about the prevalence of the poor in Germany um, and, and it deeply affected her. She felt uh, that... And she even wrote to her mother, we must do something about this as soon as possible. And, and, and she meant, uh, she was speaking about the impoverished. She would see shanties uh, lined up and, and, and people, uh, Germans dressed in rags, begging for food, um, lines of unemployed people. Uh, um, and so she uh, felt a the German, great uh, compassion. Uh, this is during the Weimar era. And then no. she also um, you know, saw a lot of bloody confrontations on the streets between communists and, and, um, and, and the police um, and social democrats as well. So it's like the left and the right uh, were, were uh, very much um, opposed. And, and she writes about um, also uh, as a sort of militaristic um, uh, um, tenor that, that uh, when she walked through the streets of Berlin, uh, there was at one point where she saw a tank come up and, and, um, and then the, the gun was pointed at a crowd of, of unemployed workers 
who were basically demonstrating. And during this time, again, this was when Germany was a parliamentary democracy. So Germans still had constitutional rights. The Weimar Constitution uh, mm -hmm. protected freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom to demonstrate in these public squares. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and there was violence, a tremendous amount of violence uh, at, at times, but uh, people still got out there and were permitted to legally. Mm -hmm. um, there were 90 daily newspapers in Berlin alone during this mm -hmm. time prior to Hitler's, um, prior to uh, him becoming chancellor. Uh, they represented every possible political uh, opinion from the extreme left to the extreme right and everything in between. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it was a, so it was a very vibrant uh, a time. And also there was a tremendous amount of strife and, and poverty and the gap between rich and poor was very pronounced. Um, and so these were all of, of the elements of the society that she wrote about in these letters to her mother. And I should point out that my grandmother, Jane, gave me these letters. So when I was mm -hmm. 16 years old, she gave them to me um, and made copies for me and mm -hmm. said, you must, you must write this book. Uh, how did she know she was, you were going to be a writer? Because you I were already write. writing at 16? <laughs> <laughs> she knew. I had already announced at the age of eight that I wanted to be a writer. Um, and, so, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and so then when I was 16, I think my grandmother, she was waiting to tell me. I mean, I, yeah. It, it was not a story to tell an eight-year-old, and and certainly right. she couldn't have taken me seriously at that age um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> about my my career ambitions. But when I was sixteen, she she felt that it was time, and um, and I, I'm just looking over here. I have the copies of of the letters. I have I have a lot of these binders, but this yeah, is an yeah. example. Um, and these were these were just they really were portals into. I don't know if you can see, but the, um, so a lot of these are typed up. Yeah. Um, and I have notes everywhere and it's threatened. And on the screen, we have a couple of notes, yeah. Yeah, but, but basically there were portals into her heart and mind, um, these letters. Yeah. I mean, I could, they're, they're the closest I got to really understanding um, uh, where she was, uh, what she thought and felt. Um, so, yeah. So her husband, Arnoff, and herself. And it's now 1933 or so. And um, for the next 10 years, basically, um, they ran... A, a powerful underground resistance to Hitler in Berlin. Um, and Arnoff uh, went, went so far, uh, uh, Arnold, Arvid, sorry. Arvid, Arvid, yeah. Arvid, right. Sorry, Arnoff. <laughs> 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 he, he, went, he went so far that he worked in the, in the Nazi uh, hierarchy. Yes. Uh, in, in order, to, in, in order to, to disguise himself. That's right. He lived That's a double really, life. That's not exactly that's not exactly a, a quiet academic life that they were planning. It is not, it, and it, oh. again, it was not one that they envisioned. And he, uh, mm -hmm. and and it's interesting uh, just to think about him. He was he he was not a risk taker, um, mm -hmm. and he his his antipathy uh, toward the Nazi Party was was and toward Hitler was uh, was um, pronounced, and so it was. Uh, he, this was something that he did very reluctantly, but he felt by 1935, um, uh, just after, you know, two years after Hitler became chancellor, uh, initially they thought that Germany would reject this man and that he was a buffoon. Uh, and a lot of people did share that view in the resistance. Mm -hmm. and, and the conservatives in the government thought that they could control him. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and, I, and I write about this uh, in, in my book, of course, and, and I talk about the ministers um, in his cabinet um, he was only allowed to appoint two ministers, uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and they were really outnumbered. Uh, and and they all thought um, that that they could control him. And and little did they know they you know they soon found out that they were wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the Mildred's uh, underground group, uh, resistance group, their first weapon against uh, the Nazi regime was paper. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they produced leaflets that denounced the regime and called for revolution. And uh, it may seem rather mild to us uh, to think about um, acts of resistance. Uh, you know, we, th we, we want to think about guns and, um, and, and setting off bombs and sabotaging um, um, the, uh, military facilities. But at this point, there was, it was not clear that, that Hitler was even planning to, um, to uh, uh, prepare Germany for war. It did become, mm -hmm. By 1935, uh, when, by the time Arvid got a job at the at the uh, Ministry of Economics, um, he started and he did this with the express purpose of gaining access to top secret documents about Hitler's uh, operational and military strategies. 
this was the new strategy. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself a, a little bit, but but uh, just to back up to the leaflets, you know, this it was exceedingly dangerous. And and if you mm -hmm. got caught with one of these leaflets, you could be hauled off to a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. And indeed, that's what happened to several members of the group. So, yeah. so that's why in 1935, they decided we need a new strategy. We need to undermine the Nazi regime from within. Arbib got a job at the, at the Ministry of Economics, pretended to be a loyal Nazi. Um, I did the Heil salute. Uh, he, he detested it, um, mm -hmm. uh, but he went through with it so that he would gain access to these documents. And the, the idea was uh, that he would then pass them off to Hitler's enemies. Um, basically, uh, basically, though, Stalin. Basically, yeah, they Stalin, gave yeah, it to Russia. Yeah. That's right. And also at, the United the States. So, yeah. so this is a, this that part of the story is something that's that's not as well understood, and that is also the news that I bring in my book. Um, mm -hmm. I I and I uh, interviewed uh, Mildred's eleven year old former eleven year old courier, uh, mm -hmm. who, who they used um, as uh, somebody who could help them uh, uh, deliver documents and and other information and set up really primarily. Um, dates when they could rendezvous outside of Berlin, um, uh, away from Gestapo surveillance, and when they could exchange verbally the most um, confidential information. And that here, yeah, are, yeah. are we seeing the picture we right have a, now? Yeah, there's a picture of Don yeah. Heath up there. So that's Don I think it's, it, it's an extraordinary thing too. This was the son of a man who worked at the embassy, the U.S. Yes, embassy. the U.S. embassy in Berlin. And the, and right. the parents said, yes, we will, you know, Son, you're you're gonna take on this life threatening job at yeah, eleven years of age. That's really right. quite something. It is quite something. That's 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 a photograph of his father, Donald Heath Sr. Mm -hmm. um, and I tracked down Donald Heath Jr. when he was eighty nine years old, and I mm -hmm. I uh, he lived in Northern California, and um and it was a it was a very it was a deeply moving uh, experience interviewing him. He um, basically welcomed me into his home as, as if I were family. He remembered my grandmother, who uh, he met when she was um, at that time just 22, mm -hmm. after she had gone to live with Mildred and, and stayed and, and married a German man. And, um, and so, uh, uh, and he said, you're, and then he told me that he ca called Mildred Aunt Mildred and, and considered mm -hmm. her a member of, of his family. And then he said, you're a member of my family, Rebecca. And Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll tell you everything um, that I remember. And it turned out that his memory was quite vivid. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and he told me about the routes that he would take to Mildred's apartment. His father uh, cautioned him to take a different route every time. Um, so he would get off at different Uvon stops and, and then he would take a detour sometimes to the Kadeve at the big department store, or he would go to the top of the American church and all the way to the spire at, at, as close as he could get and mm. survey uh, the landscape and then go down. His father uh, uh, told him to look in the reflections of the store windows to make sure nobody was following him. Mm -hmm. And then when he arrived, Mildred would also ask him, where did you go? Uh, what route did you take? Did you talk to anybody? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and this was between 1939 and 1941. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to her apartment about twice a week, ostensibly for tutoring sessions. And then at the mm -hmm. end of these sessions, then she would slip into his knapsack, a piece of paper. And, and, and again, as I alluded to earlier, um, most often it was, uh, it was a date and a time where they could rendezvous outside of, of Berlin and exchange information mm -hmm. um, uh, verbally. That's so, Mildred meeting her father, right? Sorry? The, those, those appointments were for her yeah. to meet uh, Mildred's, I mean, uh, Don's father. Right, so it was actually two couples. It was Mildred right. uh, and Arvid Harnock, and then mm -hmm. it was Don and Louise uh, Heath. And so mm -hmm. they would meet at the Spreewald, for example, and, and, and go for a hikes and, and have a picnic. And anybody who was passing by would think, oh, two couples having a picnic, isn't that lovely? And while they were indeed friends um, mm -hmm. and became quite close, uh, the, uh, there was another purpose. And, and yeah. Don would actually, uh, uh, you know, they would, uh, he was really at the center of his own John Le Carre novel. Uh, he he mm. would, uh, would um, his would run around. Uh, he dr he dressed in a um, one. He was in a boy gang uh, of uh, with other German boys. He was the only American, and mm. his friend Mole stole a Hitler youth uniform for him, so he would wear it. Um, 
though his parents, uh, uh, much to their disapproval, but he said, I have to be, have this disguise and he would yeah. run around and make sure that there were no authorities who were uh, basically eavesdropping on, on the conversation that his parents were having with Mildred and, Ar uh, and Arvid. And if he did see somebody, he would whistle a, a tune. So he, would, know, he would walk around the perimeter of where they were meeting and yeah. keep an eye out. Yes, yes. As an, as an 11, 12, 13 year old boy. That's yeah. correct. And there was one occasion when Mildred actually asked uh, Louise, uh, his mother, whether he could come to, um, to a, a location in Berlin and uh, help uh, basically perform the same um, duty, uh, basically make sure that he she wasn't being followed. And mm -hmm. she, she exchanged a satchel with a woman who was from Leipzig. Um, that's all that Don remembered. He said that mm -hmm. she was the lady from Leipzig. Um, but uh, he did the same thing. He followed them and, and sort of ran around um, and uh, pretending to uh, uh, eye squirrels uh, and, and um, in the trees. And then, and then when he saw that they were not being followed, he would whistle. Um, you know, I, I, I was deeply interested and, and the details that he provided about what it was like um, to, um, to live in Berlin, uh, the cook that they had, who was a Gestapo spy. Um, and, and he mentioned that, that his mother caught uh, this cook uh, who he called Matt, Mamzelle because he couldn't pronounce the word Mam was Mademoiselle. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, um, and she uh, spoke French and, and um, but she, she was there uh, uh, as, as uh, an employee that basically was employed cook their dinners um, and, and mm -hmm. lunches. And, and once uh, his mother caught her going through her, her diary, Louise caught mm -hmm. uh, Mamselle going through her diary. And, and I asked Don, where is that diary? And he said, oh, it's gone, it's gone. I asked him this several times over the course of my uh, interviews. Mm -hmm. And then after my, inter my final interview, Don um, uh, said, well, now I can die. And it was very mm -hmm. theatrical and moving. And I, I said, don't do that. And then a month mm -hmm. later, he did pass away. And then mm -hmm. his family invited me to come out again and go through 12 steamer trunks of documents. And I jumped on a plane again and flew out there. And it was at this time that um, I discovered Louise Heath's diary. And so mm -hmm. that, that was, that's actually not the diary, but that's something else that I can, I can explain what that is in a moment. Yeah. Um, but, it, but I do, but I do, rep, I do show photographs of the diary in the book and, and I was able to corroborate so much of what Don said. And so that was mm -hmm. very, um, that was my, it was really a Trevor, a treasure trove for me. Mm -hmm. um, it, and uh, was a, was a big moment in, in my research. Yeah, yeah, it must have been after because you'd already done a lot of research. Uh, yes, like the, the I wanted to connect those dots. Yeah, uh, oh, absolutely. And, yeah. So uh, before we go further into the story, uh, I'd like to back up just a little bit back to the early 30s again um, yeah. and, and, and talk about because I think uh, it's extremely relevant to things that are going on now in, in several countries uh, in the world and has always happened as as uh, humanity kind of plays with democracy and then and then kind of leans back towards authoritarianism and then moves in the other direction. I think things are going on in China right now that are also like this. Um, and, and of course, we had our own flirtation with authoritarianism not too long ago here. Um, and I thought it was fascinating <laughs> that you yeah, that you you discussed uh, what Goebbels said in 32 or 33 of, of how how to move society back towards authoritarianism. And, and one of the things they said, this comes right out of the news from China today, um, is the feminization of men. Yes. Uh, that I'm, I'm, you quoted Goebbels as saying, the fe you, why, why don't you, why, you'd have that quote or I'll... I do I'll actually, uh, hang yeah. on, like, I, I, um, I actually opened up to the page here um, when you first brought up women, women yeah. in Nazi Germany, okay, great. And they rapidly lost their rights. Um, and this was this early, was, early in the time of the Nazi. Early. This, yeah. is, this is very early. I have a chapter, all of my chapters, uh, it proceeds mm -hmm. chronologically. So this is, mm -hmm. this is 1933 to 1934. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, I, I, can, I can just read Just read it. it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, great yeah. because the people will be- women, uh, So uh, the role of women is to populate Germany with good Germans. This is what Minister of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels announces in a speech he delivers in a crowded hall in Berlin. He has given his speech a humdrum title, 
German women, mm. but he delivers it with verve. Women during the Weimar Republic, uh, dur dur were, during the Weimar era, were granted too many rights, Goebbels tells the crowd. Women shouldn't hold public office or compete with men in the workplace. And then he says, and I quote, the feminization of men always leads to the masculinization of women. And the net result is profound despair for both sexes. And then he goes on to say, a fundamental change is necessary. Yeah. And uh, at, at the first best and most suitable, I'm still quoting, and most suitable place for the woman is in the family. And her most glorious duty is to give children to the people and nation, children who can continue the line generations and who guarantee the immortality of the nation. And mm -hmm. Hitler goes on in another speech to echo this sentiment. He says, mm -hmm. we do not think it proper for women to invade the world of man to enter his territory. Instead, we think it natural for these two worlds to remain separate. And that is why women have always been man's helper and as such his most loyal friend and why man has always been his wife's protector and as such her best friend. And after he delivered this speech, there was a tremendous applause. Um, and, uh, and, and so, and, 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 and the, the people who were applauding um, were women in the Nazi Women's League. And so, it, it, you know, these sentiments were very much by, by a segment of the population, a very large segment embraced. And when it was popular, he, he also said, you quoted him as saying, the emancipation of women is a, a, a mistake of the Jewish intellect, or, or it's yes, like a, that's right. a Jewish yeah. idea. Yeah. Yes, it, 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 right. He, he, yes. so okay. he, blamed, he blamed that on the Jews as well. Yeah. Yes, he did. Um, it, it's also, I mean, there, there's also a small irony to the story, which is that, uh, you know, to enforce these new ideas, uh, I think it was a Goebbels' wife that was put in charge, but she didn't quite live up to the Not job. And, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you say, and who was she replaced by? That's even funnier. Why don't you tell that part of the story? That's just oh, okay. Well, uh, I, I, um, so, so Hitler establishes um, a, 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 an organization called the German Fashion Institute, and he installs Magda Goebbels uh, to, to serve as the honorary president. And she was blonde, she was blue eyed, um, and she seemed perfect for the job, a model of, of Aryan beauty um, and fertility. She had just given birth to a daughter. Uh, between 1934 and 1940, she would have five more children, all beginning with their names beginning with the letter H. Uh, yeah. and, um, and so, uh, <laughs> Hitler may have been um, honored uh, uh, by her fidelity to the letter H, but um, he was disappointed by her performance as honorary president because she would show up um, with a cigarette and a long, uh, uh, in, in a, a gold tipped uh, hand, uh, uh, handle. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, German women were not supposed to smoke. They were not supposed to wear makeup. They were supposed to wear dirndls. They were supposed to have suntanned. Uh, faces, and they were never supposed to wear anything resembling heels. Um, the, the, what was I, what was basically fetishized was uh, this idea of German peasants, and 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 and, um, and and she was the antithesis of that. Um, and, and she wore Parisian fashion, uh, and um, and so uh, she told a, ger a journalist that the German woman of the future should be stylish, beautiful, and intelligent. And she was booted basically after that. Uh, <laughs> so, not, not the same goal, right? <laughs> not the same goal at all. Uh, and, and then um, uh, the, the, that institute changed its name um, over the course of the next couple of years, but then installed a, in a leadership position uh, instead of um, Magda Goebbels was, was uh, Joseph Goebbels's mistress. Um, Hella Struhl, who happened to uh, um, live in the same apartment building as Don Heath, little Don Heath and his parents, mm -hmm. Donald and, and Louise Heath. Uh, and, and when I, I, among the documents and photographs that I found, I, um, I found evidence of that as well. Um, and also a photograph that, that, um, that, that she had taken of, um, of Don and his mother. So... All right. Well, I was a little uh, aside back to the history, but it, but definitely, um, you know, when any when any country moves and, and, and liberalizes their rules for all the different ways that people want to live their lives, um, it's not hard to, to shove it back to the sort of majority view. This is the way it should be. And 
Yes. We're going to do it that way. Um, I mean, I, so, I think it should. I think it should be, uh, you know, noted. Uh, some, 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 and I'm. I'm just going to touch on this and just tell the viewers that that I have a, a tremendous. But I did extensive research on this subject as and, and many others. But but I was very interested in in how women uh, were quickly. Um, uh, uh, demoted in society at a time mm -hmm. during the Weimar era, um, the constitution gave um, women the right to vote and women could hold public office. Um, but very quickly after Hitler became chancellor, 119,000 women in leadership positions at the ministries and in regional and local governments lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and women across Germany lost their jobs uh, as, as doctors, um, as, as lawyers. Uh, waitresses uh, were, uh, owners of restaurants were urged to fire their waitresses and replace them with waiters. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this happened in, uh, in any way in, in many segments of, of um, uh, society. And, and, in, and so um, this, this was, uh, um, in universities, there was a quota placed on the number of, of women who were allowed to be students at universities. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, fewer than 10% of, of the population of the students could be female. And prior to Hitler becoming chancellor, there were over 18,000 female university students in Germany. Mm -hmm. After Hitler took power, the number plummeted to 5,447. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, important to remember. Um, yeah. that, very important to remember. And it, it's, not, it's not just a Nazi thing, it's, a, it's an authoritarian thing that to, yeah. get, to get a large number of people in the majority view to get excited about being more restrictive to other people. Right. And so, so they pick, pick on some group that they can pick on. Right. And yeah, authoritarianism, absolutely. And, and, uh, and, and I also, and so as I follow how women's rights were taken away and, and, mm -hmm. and sort of demoted in society, of course, I follow how Jews were um, systematically persecuted. And, and, mm -hmm. and I really tell the story of the Holocaust and how it developed. So I follow all of these narrative lines um, uh, and show the reader. It was, you notice when I when I read, um, perhaps that I write in the present tense. I want mm -hmm. readers to experience um, the rise of the rapid rise of fascism as if they were there, as if it's mm -hmm. happening right now. Because I think that really drives it home. When we read history books and and, and everything is in the past tense, it, it's one it's 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 one way in which history uh, we create this kind of distance between today and and what happened before and i wanted to collapse that difference uh, and that distance and show yes there are differences certainly um but there it, it's also important to understand uh, that there are parallels as well as well mm -hmm. um and i think that that we all need a history lesson right now and we need to yep. understand how fragile democracy is and can be yep. And, and uh, how, if you just stick to a couple of principles, it can be very uh, robust. Uh, democracy can be very robust. But yeah, those correct. principles, when you, when you violate the principles, you know, you get on a slippery slope and you've got to be, you've got to watch out. And, uh, well, and, you know, people tend to think that, that uh, if they don't know the history, uh, when I speak to people, they think, and I've had a lot of readers write to me and they said, well, I thought that there was a bloody coup, you know, when Hitler took yeah, power. Right. I thought that guns were fired um, and, and, uh, and, and they had no idea this was done legally, entirely legally, mm -hmm. um, with the assent of, uh, of, of the, the people in government who held office. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, well, we'll leave a lot of those details because you did a great job of, of putting somebody right in that uh, position of watching it unfold you, through Mildred's eyes and even through Don's eyes and so on and so forth. So, I mean, you, you, it's those details are valuable. And, and so anybody who likes to read books, it's a, it's a great book to read about all that, too, besides Mildred's story. Um, but we have a little bit of time and I want to talk about the tragic end and the group of people that they got together. So now they've been spies and they've been passing information first to the Soviets, with, who they were in favor of. And then they were really obviously disappointed when Stalin made his pact with Hitler. Um, right. But they also were giving information to the Americans and then to the British. Right. Um, and so they developed this great underground resistance and, and they thought they'd have to escape. And every once in a while, so they had an escape plan. Yeah. It was all very, very uh, uh, dangerous. But you have, you have a picture of they, a lot of them got caught. 
That's um, right. So that's, and you've those got are the these... Gestapo mugshots of, yeah. of some of the members of the group. Uh, the, the Gestapo arrested 119 of them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so th there you see some some of the members, including Mildred and Arvid Harnon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it, it, the, the book coming over, or you can take a look at that snapshot and open it up a, a little bit because it's a very interesting how the people now, now they're all in prison together uh, or, or it's not, some of them are in one place, some are in another place, the women are separated from the men and everything. They, you, you said how they communicated with each other it was very interesting because they oh, were yes. all supposed to be separate. Yeah, right, right. Well, they were all arrested and thrown into the basement prison of the Stapo headquarters. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Mildred and Arvid were uh, on the way to Sweden. That was their plan. Um, mm -hmm. And they were um, caught in Nazi occupied Lithuania. By, they, knew, they knew that there had been a leak, right? They, they knew there was a leak. Uh, uh, right. One of the key members of the group, Harald schulze was arrested and his wife, Libertas, basically spread the word to as many people as possible in the group, you know, basically that the Gestapo were onto us. Um, and yeah. so Mildred and Arvid tried to flee. They were they were they were uh, arrested by uh, an SS officer named Horst Koko and uh, hauled back to Gestapo headquarters, as were others in the group uh, over the course of the next few months. And um, and so uh, the they would uh, the, the basement prison and Gestapo headquarters soon filled to capacity, and so the women were sent to women's prisons in in Berlin and the men to men's prisons. Mildred uh, was then uh, taken back to Gestapo headquarters daily and interrogated and tortured, um, as were others in the group. And uh, and then there was a preparation for a mass treason trial, and um, and uh, basically uh, um, there were this this mass treason trial. It was really there was no. Uh, it had the appearance of, of due process, but of course. Um, nothing that there was no justice served at all. Um, and it was a little, they, a little ironic because they, they kind of took that show trial from Stalin. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's, that's exactly this, right. Yeah. Who this group Absolutely. group had supported all the way until Stalin turned on him. So they, right. you know, and, terrible and, irony. And a terrible irony. I, um, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and, and during this time, you know, they were not allowed, members of the, of the of this group were not allowed to communicate with one another. It was strictly prohibited. And so they developed methods of communicating. And, and mm -hmm. there were two primary ways that, that I uncovered in my research. One was a kind of knock language. And Gunther Weissenborn writes about this. Uh, he's a survivor, actually. He, is, mm -hmm. he, he managed to survive mm -hmm. um, and, and wrote about this in his memoir. And so, uh, and, and he basically developed a, a, an alphabet of knocks, and uh, and 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 soon others learned this knock language, and they were able to warn each other about police, uh, um, about guards, about the interrogators, about um, there were uh, basically the authorities were trying to, and, it, and again, sort of the appearance of justice. Uh, they needed two pieces of evidence uh, to condemn somebody to death. Um, um, as a traitor. And so uh, it, it was very easy under torture to get evidence that yeah, people would just blurt out other people's names. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and so in the knock language was a way of informing people in the group, oh, so-and-so said this about the other person and make sure that mm -hmm. you don't say this or make sure you contradict that to, to save that person. And mm -hmm. so that was one, um, that was one method and and I and you know late at night you could hear a symphony of knocks uh, in, in, in these in these men's prisons another method uh, that women did uh, uh, used in was uh, these notes which are which have a German word called Kassiber and they're basically secret notes passed in prison they would uh, again convey information gossip news um, and uh, well, Arnav, can you can you can Arnav, yeah. can you show oh, like yes, a copy? Right. We do have a slide. Of we that. have a copy of that one. Yeah, I think it's the um, next slide. Yeah, uh, not well, that. The one before that. Intelligence document. Keep going. That Here one. we go. Yeah. So this is I feature this in my book. This is a Casimir. This is an example of one. It's a large one. Sometimes the, the, there are little bits of paper, and sometimes they're mm -hmm. on a full piece of paper. And and this is one actually where somebody's the the, the person who's writing this. Um, wrote about Mildred and wrote about uh, one of the members of the group who betrayed her to uh, Gestapo interrogators. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and they would pass these notes uh, in the prison yard. They were allowed to take one very brief walk uh, once a day out in the prison yard and sort of around the periphery. Mm -hmm. um, and they would secretly pass them. Um, they would also uh, hide them um, in the cracks and fissures of the prison walls. And they would, and the reason we have some of them today is that um, they would, 
they would sew them into the seams of their garments. Um, mm -hmm. One way that the prisons saved money uh, during the Nazi regime was to require the families of the prisoners to pick up the dirty laundry and, and to do their laundry and then bring mm -hmm. it back, um, which became an excellent way to pass notes. Um, yeah, and, I was going to uh, say, how, how, what a dumb way to save money. <laughs> <laughs> so, exactly. This is why we have these notes. Um, so, yeah. so I found these in, in a Berlin archive at the Gedenkstätte Deutsche Widerstand. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, so they're in prison and they're brought up for trial. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, uh, Mildred, who is understood to be one of the ringleaders, I think, right, by, by, by the uh, Nazis. By the, um, yes, yes. Although, although she tried to, to save herself and, um, uh, and present herself as somebody who didn't know anything. Didn't know anything. So she, yeah. she was able to keep, to, to, to not saying anything for a long period of time, or she never said anything, right? So uh, you mean in the courtroom? She never, she never confessed or gave out. I mean, that, that's that was the impression I got. Oh, from right, no, under interrogation, she never, no, she she did not. Never um, yeah. Right, no, she did not. And then, uh, and and then during the first trial in December, um, she basically um, capitalized on the sort of internalized sexism of, of the men who were in the room right. and just said she was just a wife. She didn't know anything. Um, right. She uh, and and so she and, and I should also mention that the courtroom was in um, it was a military court. It was the, the Reich court martial it's called the Reichskriegsgericht. And usually the defendants who were uh, who were there were military uh, officers. But, you know, everybody else was a civilian. And so this was this was unusual. Um, and and uh, and during that first trial, she saw Arvid for the first time. She hadn't seen him for three and a half months. Uh, during that time, she was in solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. And um, and Arvid was uh, was declared a traitor, and he received a death sentence to be hanged. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Harold Schultz Boysen also received the same sentence and punishment, and um, and but and, and others in the group as well. But Mildred uh, was given a, a sentence of six years in prison in a, mm -hmm. in a kind of a work camp. Two days later. Um, Hitler found out about this and and ordered a reversal. And so mm. on February 16th, 1943, she was strapped down to a guillotine at Plutensee Prison and beheaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and, yeah. and we have an article that came out about it there from the New York Times, right? And yeah, so the New York and, Times, that was in 19, December 1st, 1947. Uh, and there are little red arrows pointing at all of the errors. Uh, there are so many uh, inaccuracies and errors um, over over the decades since her execution um, that that have that gets sort of passed down from one decade to to another. Um, so it's, uh, it's interesting in journalism. I mean, if you ever do something and then it's written about, you can always see the errors and you wonder how many stories are you. Sometimes they get it actually close yeah. to being right, at least in the big picture, but then a lot of yeah. details are wrong. But the, it's not unusual for there to be six or seven mistakes in an article like this, the image is, is grabbed and, and, and sent out. So the image at the time was, and it was, uh, when when did this show up? Was it be, at, right it at was the December time, right? 1, 1947. Yeah. Right. Okay. And it says uh, Hitler beheads American woman, uh, uh, right. something like that. I can't read the, the headline. It's too small. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, as a, yeah, Hitler beheads American woman as a personal, personal revenge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but so did, did, her, how did the information leak out to the family? Did, did it get oh, well, to the family a, right away? It's a long, it's, it's, uh, there, I, I describe in detail the, the attempt of, of Harriet, um, her eldest sister. Um, by that time, their mother had died. And so Harriet took it upon herself to try to track her down. She wrote to the Red Cross um, and she uh, it, it was very frustrated. They hadn't heard for all of a sudden the letters stopped, you know, and so right. she, is, is this something to do with the war? Has something happened? Um, and, uh, and, and then she discovered, um, uh, I don't know if I should give this away, actually. So no, you don't. You don't have to give it away. <laughs> <laughs> it's a we, good can have, we can have some secrets for the book. <laughs> we have some, read, read the book and find out more. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it, it was a very unusual way of finding out that you know what what had happened to to her sister, and and um and really I think illustrates just the um how information was was uh, so precious and how precious little there was of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I know that we're running out of time and we w might want to take questions, but, but I also want to point out what the, the, the title of my book, people often ask why uh -huh. all the frequent troubles of our days. And yep. it's a line from a Goethe poem that she was translating right before she was, uh, you know, executed. And, and there is a, a, a slide, a slide on, on that one. Yeah. You can if find you could... that, that, um, that 
but I, I include a photograph of the book. Um, right. And um, uh, there we go. So that that's yeah. that's one page. Um, and so you see her handwritten English translations in the margins of that uh, that, that book of Goethe poetry. So mm -hmm. she was bent over this book of poems when the uh, the uh, prison chaplain Harald Kulschau came in uh, right before she was executed, and and um, he was there to give her comfort. He was also there as a member, a secret member of the resistance. Right. And um, and he uh, he wrote a memoir after the war, but he often passed notes between families and the condemned. And one thing that he did was was uh, was um, smuggle this book out under the folds of his robes. And mm -hmm. so this is why we have the book today, and 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 it um, it's in a German archive. As you said, there there's, there wasn't much leaking of information, but it's still impressive how much information did leak and how many holes there were in a system that attempts to be absolute, you know, in stopping people. Um, yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah. And then one of the lessons from this is if you're ever put in that position, you know, lie to the authorities based on their own preconceived concepts about what your what their prejudices are about you. You'll probably have your best bet of getting uh, as much out of the situation as you possibly can, even though it's, you know, that, that's that's not saying much. Um, it, it, it can be a good strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Let's go through the last uh, few pictures, and then I'll ask, uh, we'll, we'll do some oh, questions sure. from the audience. So let's just yeah. go through. So in this so, uh, this piece of information, yeah. Uh, this is an example of one of the uh, intelligence documents that I uncovered in my research, and it just uh, sort of does illustrate some of the the ingrained sexism, even in the authorities um, who were looking at this case uh, in the United States. And you see, um, there there's a list of all of the people in the in the group, uh, the men and the women. And in one column, and and in the other column, it's uh, is listed their professions and. And you'll see the, the the red arrows point to the women's professions, mm -hmm. uh, and in every case, it's wife of that, that was their profession. Yeah. And even Mildred was a was a professor. You know, she had her PhD. She lectured mm -hmm. at the University of, of um, Berlin. But according to this um, U.S. intelligence document, she was just a wife. Um, and so that's telling in terms of the historiography of, of yeah. this group. And that was the U.S. intelligence. That was the U.S., yeah. And we're not talking about the Nazis here. This is what the U.S. said. This and and this, this there's another, the other people are aware of this too. You're not the only one that's written about this, of course. But the use of some of the Nazis by the U.S. intelligence services after the war, um, I mean, they, they allowed them to go to work for them instead of, instead of being, uh, you know, put on trial. Yes, that's true. Uh, U.S. Uh, and British intelligence recruited Nazis who were involved in the arrest, torture, and execution of Mildred Harnock, as well yeah. as others. That's another. And they never detail. faced trial at Nuremberg. No, no, they had too much valuable information for something else. Well, yeah, for, uh, it was for particularly the, against the Soviets, right? That's exactly yeah. right. They, they yeah. basically these Nazis um, sort of. Uh, duped uh, U.S. And, and British intelligence into thinking that they had access to uh, knowledge of a vast Soviet um, espionage network that was threatening um, their democracies, and this was just a fiction. Uh, but so, but so they use the they use the same strategy that I was suggesting to other people. When somebody's in charge of you, you lie to them about their preconceived notions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> it yeah. worked for them. They, it worked they, for them. That's right. Yeah. They got free for the rest of their lives. Um, so uh, let's let's look at the next one. Yeah. Okay. This is a picture oh, of Mildred. Just an East German stamp. Yeah. More stuff about sexism. You see, Arvid Harnock is Doctor Arvid Harnock, and Mildred is Mildred Harnock. Even though both right. of them had PhDs. Yeah. And, and we the next recently one, yeah. had a we recently had a controversy of that, of course. Um, uh, you know, in our in our current cultural environment. So it, right. it was an, an example of a sort of parallel. Um, and, and these slides just, this is David Dolan, who was, a, who was a, a, a historian and in his book, Soviet Espionage, you know, this is how he described Mildred, essentially a non-political person uh, interested only in literature and languages. Yeah. These were wow. the people who used to write about Mildred. And there's another one, Heinz Hohne, who was, um, who was an editor at Der Spiegel, uh, a very respected um, uh, journalist. Mm -hmm. And in his book about uh, this group, he said, um, published in, in the 70s, he said, as a wife, Mildred followed her husband's line. She was basically non-political. Um, well, we have, a, we have a, a good question in from the, the audience that's right up this line. Yeah. Uh, they, wanted, they wanted to know, um, does, did this uh, circle of uh, the resistance, was it connected to any other groups and did they have any influence or know the people who tried to kill Hitler, which was 
Oh, oh, oh I, lo I love this question. No. Yes. Uh, so, so the group that Mildred nicknamed the circle in the early 30s uh, intersected with, with at least uh, three other underground resistance networks, a small, it was a sort of small, scrappy uh, uh, groups, uh, underground groups that formed a kind of interlocking chain. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, Mildred's husband, Arvid Harnock, was related to a number. Um, his his a number of his cousins were involved in the Valkyrie plot, uh, the 1944 July plot to assassinate Hitler, um, mm -hmm. including um, Hans von Dopnani, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Klaus Bonhoeffer, and er Ernst von Harnack. Um, and uh, used to a, a relative. Anyway, yeah. Pardon me. The, Har the Harnack was a relative. I mean, yes, a yes, cousin, and, so. and these others I named were cousins. Uh, so there was a basically yeah. a, a bunch of. Fit uh, families who grew up, the Harnocks lived next to a, a number of other families in a suburb of, of Berlin called Grunewald, and, and they intermarried, and, and they were all staunchly anti-Nazi and very committed to the resistance. And so, uh, and so yes, um, there also his brother, Falk Harnock, was a member of the Weisse Rosa, the, the White Rose, if anyone has heard of that. And right. so there was communication between these groups, definitely, and, and there were, there were, there were, um, connections that that united them it's amazing that they you know that there was no leak for so many years because of the interconnections so from one group to the next you'd think somebody yeah it is could. surprising yeah it they must not have they must not have placed any agents in there for quite a while yes so uh, we wanted it, to, it, it, yeah mm -hmm. the, the, the next question goes right to that because it's how how what was the leak how did it unravel you know how did they get oh. caught to give a very simple, it's a it, yeah, do, it, do a very short version. So very read the short book. version because it has <laughs> actually a very complicated answer, which yeah. which took a, a lot of pages to to, to, um, mm -hmm. uh, to chronicle. But but essentially, um, uh, during the war, when the group was passing information to the Soviets to Moscow Center, um, they used radio transmitters, and uh, and and one of these um, messages was intercepted. Um, by the Funkabwehr, the, the, the um, radio uh, signals uh, uh, part of the Abwehr, which is German intelligence. And, and uh, they intercepted uh, several of these uh, messages. And there was a, basically the person who had written the message had committed a fatal Espionage 101 um, uh, error and had listed the real names and addresses of members of the group, not uh, code mm -hmm. names. And so it only, it, it, the Fulkovver basically put their finest cryptologists on the job and it took them a year, but they cracked the code and, uh, and then the Gestapo pounced and arrested yeah. as many as they could. So, so it was encoded information, but there was, they didn't use the coded names. They used the real names. They used the real names. And yes. so it took them a year to find, figure it out. But once they had cracked the code, they, they knew exactly who, whose houses to go to. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Um, also, maybe uh, tell Libertas' story. Um, that's that's for me. I mean, that that was just tough. That she she was the one that warned them off when they first came in, but she was also the one that couldn't couldn't stand up to the torture. Right. That's right. She actually she wasn't. Uh, There's was no available evidence that she was tortured. She was she was assigned a different interrogator, um, uh -huh. not not uh, that the, the interrogator who was who was basically known for being a, a sadistic and, and the mm. one who tortured both Mildred and Arvid. Um, but uh, Libertas um, was also quite two-faced and she basically um, told the Gestapo, in an, in an effort to save herself uh, when she was interrogated, she whispered the names of numerous members of their group um, who the Gestapo had actually had no idea uh, about at all, including Hans and Hilda Koppi, um, whose son, Hilda was, was um, quite pregnant and she gave birth in prison um, mm -hmm. and, and her son, Hans Koppi Jr. Um, uh, basically is, um, committed his life to studying the resistance. And, and I got in contact with him and he um, was, is the director of the Red Orchestra Collection at the Gedenkstätte Deutsche Friedestadt, the German Resistance Memorial Center. And so he provided me with a lot of these documents. Um, and he literally, was, he literally was born uh, just before his mother was executed. Um, he was born right before, yes, as, as she was allowed to breastfeed him, and then uh, they decapitated her. Right. And, um, and, uh, yeah. and then he was given to, who was he, was he given to an adoption service? How did he find out who, who his parents were? 
Do you know? I don't uh, know. Oh, well, one of the surviving members, um, Greta Kukov, uh, uh, was, was his godmother, his godmother. Um, uh -huh. And uh, but with family members, he was they, he was turned over to family members. But oh, uh, Greta Kukov stayed in touch with him, and um, and and uh, and and Hans Koppi and I, uh, he he actually took me on a um, a tour around Berlin, and and we mm -hmm. drove to all the different uh, places where Mildred lived, um, mm -hmm. and, and he was a, a tremendous resource for me. So how yeah. long did you spend uh, doing this research? Because it sounds like um, this was a big project, very big project. Oh yes, it was a tremendous project. I think that, you know I've I've done research over the years. I mean, I've, I certainly when I held right. the, the letters um, that my uh, grandmother gave me when I was sixteen, um, uh, that was the first time I was acquainted with um, any kind of research materials. Uh, she also was the person who told me about Don Heath and said there was a, an eleven-year-old boy who was Mildred's courier. Mm -hmm. um, so I just the, the name just stuck in my head. Um, and then over the year, you know, I decided that I would keep my promise and I would write this book one day. Um, mm -hmm. I did decide that I would write a few more books before I wrote this one because it, it is, I, I knew that it was, um, that it would require tremendous research and, mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to do justice to the story. So after my, my second book was published, I went to Berlin and went to the Gedenkstätte to Deutsche Bundesstadt, this, this archive. Mm -hmm. And I met with um, the director there and asked if I could gain access to the documents. And he said yes. And, and so that that sort of I began then, but actually uh, then I, I did set it aside uh, before I got too involved and wrote, an, wrote another book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then in the run up to the presidential election uh, 2016, I, I thought, I put that that book aside, and I thought I need, I actually need to write this book now. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I I started researching this book in earnest, mm -hmm. and and I went to archives, um, uh, other archives as well. And in Berlin, I went to the National Archive in, in London to look at their espionage uh, files. I went to the Library of Congress here in the U.S. and the National Archives, and and then and I went to Wisconsin and and, at, and across the United States and various places to to gather as much information as possible and. And I also worked with a Moscow-based historian um, who had access to archives and intelligence documents as well. Most of those documents are under lock and key, I should say. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I was aware that uh, you know, there, there are, of course, holes in a story um, when a lot of uh, the documents were destroyed by the Nazis. I mean, the, the, the trial transcripts um, from the Reichskriegsgericht uh, mass trial um, they were destroyed by, by Nazi authorities. There are two stories about what happened. Uh, one story goes that the, somebody made a big pyre and, and torched them all. And, and another story is um, that, that they buried them in, in Lunenburg and, and they're somewhere there uh, buried, mm -hmm. um, who knows. Um, but, but we do have the sentencing documents. So we do know, uh, this is why we know that Mildred was able to uh, convince um, this panel of judges um, that that she was just a wife and she didn't know what was going on in the first trial anyway. Well, Rebecca, you did more than justice to the story. You did a great job of bringing that to life. I mean, it was really um, moving and it moved very, very quickly. And it was a nice, very, very unique uh, viewpoint on, on something that we hope doesn't repeat itself in history, but unfortunately does. Um, Thank so you. Thank you, first, thanks for bringing it out. I, I'm glad your family is all happy that you brought it out as well. Oh, yes, um, because yeah. <laughs> every once in a while, every once in a while, one doesn't like to drag out, <laughs> right. drag out the relative that that uh, people don't want to talk about. But uh, but your family, well, no, my family very, very is proud. Yeah, they're 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 proud very of proud. Yeah. Legacy too, and, and yeah. yeah. So, um, well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, our our pleasure. Thank you very much. And so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its one hundred and nineteenth year of enlightened discussion. Thanks again, Rebecca. It was great. Thank you, George.